then, please help me in welcoming welcome to the stage one of the greatest minds that Canada has ever seen, Dr. Gordon Neufeld. I think I've got, yes. I noticed you didn't say one of the greatest bodies <laughs> Canada has ever seen. <laughs> I wish. But thank you for that very generous introduction. I don't deserve it at all, but I appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you, Karen, for all your efforts in organizing this conference on child development. And I'm also delighted to, uh, to share some of the spotlight uh, with my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Gabor Maté. Uh, sadly, our paths won't cross. Uh, I'll be leaving tonight, and he'll be joining you tomorrow. Uh, but we're glad to, uh, uh, to be able to, to be together at this, at, at least in terms of share this responsibility. <clears throat> I'm going to start off today by talking about a problem that very few recognize is a problem, and that is a problem. It was such a problem I didn't know how to title the book. I had no idea. I started off wanting to write a book on attachment. As I was putting the pieces together, uh, as a theorist, as a therapist, as an academic, I was uh, studying uh, all of the various attachment theories in whatever name they were, and it became apparent to me that something was amiss. As I began to understand that the attachment was a preeminent need of, uh, of all creatures and the context in which, uh, in which we are meant to be raised and for all creatures, I realized that something was going wrong because we were losing our children to their peers. Now, this is so normal it is so absolutely typical, and we are trained to think that what is normal is natural. There is a huge blindness, and we don't see it. So I, was, I didn't know what to name the book. I was going to name it The Pure Problem. Uh, Random House said no, and so I got back by labeling my presentation The Pure Problem. <laughs> and it's basically why adults matter more than peers. And I've also borrowed a picture from Judith Harris's book, The Nurture Assumption, that this book was largely answered, hold on to your kids, is what it finally got named, in answer to, and, and Judith Harris has this book on her cover, and it says on the first edition, not later editions, but on the first edition, and says, this is what is and therefore should be. And the point of my book is not to quarrel with this is what is, but this was never meant to be. It was never meant to be historically, culturally. It was never meant to be. And so that is what I'm going to try and talk about today and come through the back door talking about this problem and to talk about attachment. Uh, I needed a whole book to, to uh, write about it uh, because, again, it's not a problem that people recognize. It's the way they think the world operates. Uh, although this is a very, very recent blip in uh, human history, uh, our, our first signs of this occur in the 1960s. And so it's very recent, the last 50 years of human civilization. But it's changing the face of civilization, and it's set up for other huge problems that are escalating bullying, as well as digital preoccupations of our children. But these are all founded upon peer orientation. So that's why I'm beginning today on peer orientation, on the peer problem, and then we'll continue with the hot topic uh, that everybody wants to talk about, uh, and that is the bully problem, and then to the most current issue that is changing the face of our society today, and that is the digital revolution, uh, the information age that we are well into, and its impact for child development and for the raising of children. Now, why did I, I call this uh, peer orientation, and what is peer orientation? Uh, I, I didn't call it peer attachment, because that's not what it is about. It often gets misunderstood. It's not peer attachment. There's no problem with children attaching to their peers. That's not a problem at all. 
Uh, children, uh, we all can attach to many things, our pets, our, our spouses, um, our, our parents, um, uh, even the game of golf. Uh, we can attach to many things. The problem is if one of those attachments competes with the primary attachments, then there is a problem. If you're a wife and, and your, your spouse has competing attachments, there is a problem because it pulls out of orbit from you. And that's exactly the issue. It is not attachments. It is something that's happening in our society that is actually pulling children out of orbit from the adults who are responsible for them. Now, that may not seem like a big thing to you, and that's why we have to look at, at the role of attachments, how they, they play in child development. But once you realize uh, that the attachments to the adults responsible are key, it begins to dawn, it begins to dawn on us uh, what the problem is. And so peer orientation is speaking about a working attachment. Now, one of the primary uh, um, works of, of attachment, uh, the, um, why attachment is necessary fundamentally is for us to get our bearings, for us not to feel lost, for us to have a sense of who we are, how we matter, uh, for us to be able to get our cues for what's important, uh, for what values, so everything that has to do with getting our bearings. Uh, that's part of the work of attachment. And we basically, uh, an, an attachment creates a compass point for us. And we get our bearings by that. And so the peer orientation speaks uh, to when children are getting their bearings uh, through their peers, those that are of equal age to them, of uh, who they are, of, uh, of, of what's important, of what's valued. Um, they take their cues from their peers as to what matters most, as well as how to act, how to talk, how to dress. And so we have for the first time the appearance in the 1960s of a, a, of a youth culture, a peer culture, never existed before. And so we, we, uh, we uh, euphemize that as a pop culture. In other words, the culture comes uh, from, uh, from what is popular and the masses rather than being handed down. And now we have a culture of the 70s, of the 80s, of the 90s, and we continue on. And the problem is, is this culture cannot transmit itself, its values, it shifts continually as, as uh, the, uh, our children look to each other for their cues. Uh, the implications are huge uh, from a sociological and anthropo uh, anthropological point of view. And peer orientation is to, uh, uh, to prefer the company of one's peers over that of the adults in one's life, especially when there is some distress. I, I remember uh, when I was uh, touring with the book, uh, uh, Hold On to Your Kids, and I was on various radio shows and uh, would have adolescents share with the, uh, you know, a call in in terms of the radio shows, and it would be like, you're out of your mind. Why would any adolescent go to their parents uh, about their troubles or about the things that concerned them? And then I would basically look at the host, and you get my point. You get my point. Uh, this is, it, it is self-evident to many of our children that they belong with each other, that their compass points are each other, uh, that their working relationships uh, with, are with each other. It is also self-evident to many of us as adults that, uh, that we belong with our peers instead of natural constellations of family groupings. Unfortunately, we're into third generation now of peer orientation, and unfortunately, it is now self-evident to many of the grandparents that they, would, uh, that they belong to each other, they prefer to be with each other. And most traditional societies are grandparent-centric. That is, when the grandparents are no longer playing the role, their anchor role in being able uh, to raise our offspring and children, we're in trouble and we're losing our grandparents. They would prefer to be with each other rather than uh, with their grandchildren. And so we are, we are having a, a huge shift in our society, which is also the uh, under uh, uh, the um, the underpinning of some of what we see is happening in the digital revolution uh, that is here. So, uh, what is peer orientation? Uh, we can't understand peer orientation 
unless we first of all understand attachment. And there is a problem because of our understanding of attachment tends to be rather reductionistic in our society. It attempted to come over uh, the Atlantic Ocean from Europe and from Britain in the 1950s, but it came across as a very much of a baby bonding theory. And it's got stuck in terms of a theory that has to do with infants and toddlers. And so our greatest pediatricians in the States who were attachment pediatricians, Brazelton and Sears, they didn't go above age three, basically, in terms of their theorizing. And so we've had a problem. And, uh, and, uh, and those that went into research about it uh, did their research primarily around the strange phenomena around infancy and toddlerhood at, at, uh, the, uh, at the most. So here is a problem. Uh, of course, peers are not a problem for infants and toddlers. Uh, peers are not a problem, and so if we don't understand and don't have a proper uh, understanding of attachment, we don't, uh, we don't understand peer orientation. Remember one of the interviews, I believe it was in, in, in Ottawa, in which uh, a leading pediatrician, no, I think it was here in, in, uh, uh, in Toronto, a leading pediatrician wanted to uh, debate with me on, uh, on television uh, about my book. Uh, I didn't know he hadn't read my book, uh, but he had read the title. And, uh, and he said, uh, I find your theory of attachment hopelessly reductionistic. And he obviously didn't understand metaphor about holding on to your kids, and so it was a physical thing. He said, you know, I agree that, uh, that mothers should hold their children when they breastfeed them. And uh, so, okay, he had rather a black and white mind, a reductionistic way of thinking, but I said, what other things would you consider to be important? And he said, oh, things like love and significance and relationship, and I said, and you don't think these are about attachment? Oh, no, attachment is about what happens in infancy, and that's the problem. That's the problem. Attachment is actually the most significant factor and force in the universe. And if you don't know how big it is, you don't know how to explain the phenomena that is happening around us and what is happening in terms of the digital revolution and with our children. You've got to understand attachment. My uh, advantage is, is that I come from a natural science background. Uh, my major was in chemistry and in physics. And so I, I, uh, this informs my understanding of this. And, uh, and in physics, attachment is huge. In physics, it is all about that the whole idea, the first characteristic of every particle is that every particle attaches to other particles that get stuck on each other. This is the basis of all matter. You cannot discuss. We've had two who won Nobel Prizes for studying the attachment behavior of the most the smallest particle in the universe, the quark. And so when we don't, if we understand that this is, this is a universal principle. Uh, I had the uh, opportunity to go on sabbatical uh, some time ago now, take a year off to study attachment. And I try to put all the pieces together to be able to create a coherent theory of attachment that brings us all the way through the, through the years. And to my surprise, I discovered that it takes at least six years to begin to, for the relationship to develop, the capacity for a relationship to develop, and that this was primarily sequential. And I get to present this theory at international attachment conferences throughout the world, and I hope it will be one of my contributions in terms of this area, but I share it very briefly here with you. Uh, the, uh, it's how, uh, re remember, attachment is simply about the science of relationship. It's about relationship, and it's about how it unfolds. Now, attachment itself uh, is uh, the scientific definition of attachment, the non-reductionistic definition, is that drive or relationship characterized by the pursuit and the preservation of proximity. If you're a physicist, as I said, you see this as characteristic of every particle in the universe. If you're a chemist, you see that chemistry is all about the attachment of one element to another, creating compounds on the basis of, uh, of, all, uh, of all matter. If you're, if, uh, you're an astronomist, uh, you understand uh, that this describes uh, the uh, gravity uh, and uh, the forces 
of, uh, of gravity keeping uh, the, uh, the moon revolving around the earth and the earth around the sun and that the whole universe is a universe of attachment. Uh, magnetism is a force of attachment. Fusion is a force of attachment. And here I have a plant analogy in terms of plants, at least as much energy in the plant goes in terms of attaching through the roots. A plant can never be too attached. A plant can be too superficially attached. A plant can be too insecurely attached, but it can never be attached. It's only when the roots find what they are seeking for that there is nurturance and energy that goes into maturation. And so maturation and attachment are not opposites. You need to attach in order for any maturation to result. We understand this well in plants, and this should be our, our, uh, our model, in a sense, for living things to start off with how it works in plants. Now, uh, a little later, I'll, I'll just share the six-stage theory, first of all, but when we get to this, we realize the, the main thing about attachments, the main thing uh, that to those that were, were trying to outline how preeminent this need is, how it's the first need, it even trumps food because we need to attach in order to be fed. It even trumps food. But the main thing is, is the discovery of science is that the context for raising children is their attachments to the adults responsible for them. That's true of all mammals. The context for raising children is their attachments to the adults responsible for them. This one understanding alone in which, in, in which is, is unequivocal, it is... It is the basic understanding of the science of relationship. This would revolutionize our education, our daycare. It would revolutionize our parenting. Uh, it would revolutionize our whole approach to this. We have lost this. This is what differentiates us from any traditional culture, is that this was embedded into that culture. Uh, and this, this, if we understand this, then we begin to, to look at and investigate and appreciate the impact of peer orientation. Because when children, instead of revolving around the adults responsible for them, instead of their grandparents and their parents and their teachers and their uncles and aunts and their daycare providers and all of those who are part and are, who are taking care of raising our children, when children instead start orbiting around each other, it sabotages this context. And that is the main issue. Pure orientation sabotages the context for raising children. It sabotages it. Now again, I go back to well, what is meant to happen. We can't know what is wrong unless we know what is meant to happen. When Judith Harris wrote uh, her book, The Nurture Assumption, she didn't come at it from a developmental point of view. She came at it from a very superficial point of view that we study what is and assume it should be. And so it was that simple. It didn't come from an understanding of how it is that children develop. What are the conditions that are conducive for it? What is it that they need? Everything begins there. And I'll share with you the conclusions of my sabbatical in terms of putting together a cohesive and comprehensive theory of attachment, the six-stage theory of attachment. Uh, hopefully, I, I will do it very quickly. I, it really would take a book to walk all the way around it. I have one intensive. I try and teach my material in three intensives, and the intensive three is all about this diagram about the six stages of attachment. We walk it through uh, in, uh, in about 20 hours, and so I will walk it through in about five minutes. Uh, since you are exceptionally bright here in Toronto, uh, being in the center of the universe uh, where all uh, uh, intellects come together, uh, we'll do this very, very, uh, very quickly. Uh, says a Vancouverite acknowledging uh, the, what we see is a maturation part of growth. Uh, this is the outcome of attachment. We must never forget that. What you actually look at in growth, those are truly realizing their potential as human beings. And right off, the whole, the basic thesis of the developmental approach, and I'm a developmentalist, the basic thesis of the developmental approach is that 
where development, the realization of human potential is spontaneous, it is not inevitable. Very simply, we all grow older, we don't all grow up. You might know one or two in your life. It's always more apparent in others than it is in us. And so immaturity is epidemic, as Robert Bly says in Sibling Society, and considers us it to be the epidemic of our time. We're not growing up. If we're not growing up, it's because the condu- conditions that are conducive to maturation in our society are not there. Well, what is meant to happen? What is meant to happen is we're meant to enter our, to realize our potential as human beings rather spontaneously if the conditions are conducive. But like a plant, it's all based on the quality of the rootedness. And the first root, and a, a plants can have multiple roots, and this one, for the sake of analogy, is. And the capacity for relationship Uh, uh, if all goes well, will unfold during the first six years of life. And during those first six years of life, as in most traditional cultures, contact and closeness must be continuous. I don't mean physical contact and closeness. This will come through here, but some kind of proximity. And this is how it's meant to unfold. Uh, First of all, it is uh, classic uh, attachment theories uh, talk about this because this is what we share with all other mammals is that we seek contact and closeness uh, through the senses, through being in sight, in smell, in hearing, and in sound. And so this is uh, hearing and sound, that was the same, wasn't it? And so we we seek proximity uh, through being with. We seek to be with those whom we're attached. And this is is obvious, the preeminent need of, uh, of young children. But by the second year of life, by the second year of life, that should now add, and very few theories talk about this, actually one of the most, uh, and, and this is simply that we seek to be like those to whom we're attached. We seek to take on the same form as them. We seek to emulate, imitate them. This is the key to language acquisition is that the very simplest thing is that we talk like those to whom we're attached. We talk like those to whom we're attached to. Now, this is the, key. This is the same for all mammals and, uh, and even birds. Is that, that is the key to, uh, to acquisition. Now, that in itself would revolutionize our school system. We are losing the war on literacy the average vocabulary of adolescence is actually decreasing over the decades. But who is it that they're attached to? Each other. So who are they talking like? Each other. And how many words do they need to talk to each other with? Apparently not many. (laughs) And so we're actually losing the war. Now, we are spending all kinds of money on this. And if you look around, those of you that are educators today are listening as educators You realize how many literacy programs there are about trying to teach children to speak, to write, all the things around language, and the very simple thing we've missed, the most simple thing of all, we talk like those to whom we are attached. I was very attached to my Mrs. Ackerberg, my grade one teacher. She was very British. My second name is Arthur, and she called me Arthur. And for five years, I called myself Arthur. I talk like her, I used her idioms, I used her her form of language. I love the literature she read to us. Why? Because I was attached to her. Not because she was a good teacher, but because I was attached to her. And that is key, and that is key on taking the same form. This is wonderful, because it means we stamp our form on children. Many people say, how do you know children are attaching to each other? Look at them. They're talking like each other, dressing like each other, acting like each other. That's exactly the picture that I, I, I showed uh, in the very title slide. That is emulating each other, modeling. They're meant to emulate those and model after those that are responsible for them. But again, this is just, this is just the beginning. This doesn't go away. But on the basis of being like, another root in the third year comes down. And in the third year of life, a child will seek to belong to my mummy. And don't let anybody come in between. You might have a spouse that is still at this level. Jealousy and possessiveness. 
And uh, basically, you, you belong, and this is incredibly important, but here it is. We are meant to belong to those who are responsible for us. We have become so peer-oriented as a culture, we think that children are meant to belong to each other and to their peers. Uh Uh-uh. They're meant to belong to those to whom are responsible. This is very important to create a context in which development happens. And in the wake of belonging are the instincts of loyalty. We don't talk about these anymore, but these are huge attachment instincts. Here, to be close means to be on the same side as. So we have closeness means to be with, closeness means to be like, closeness now means to be on the same side as. And so it means to take the side of, to stand up for, to protect, to defend. It also means to serve and obey. And so the very first time, the child in the third year of life actually has instincts to obey. That's why we call it the terrible twos. There's not a bone in their body that it would occur to them that to be close to you is to do your bidding. They just want to sit on your lap. They want to be like you, wear your shoes, uh, you know, speak like you. And then finally, it is a, a, a result of attachment, just like the secret of language acquisition is attachment. So the secret of the instincts to do one's bidding is attachment. We only seek to obey those to whom we are attached. When we have problems with attachments, we have problems with, with compliance and obedience. When children are more attached to their peers, who are they trying to be good for? Who are they obeying? We call it peer pressure. This isn't peer pressure. It doesn't come from the outside. It comes from the inside. The attachment instincts are awry. That's what the problem is. They are meant, they were always meant to feel pressured by their teachers and their parents. And as long as, they, as, as long as they're attached, they do to be good for. But when it comes to their peers, we lose them. Now, if everything goes well by the fourth year of life, it will occur to a child that mommy and daddy hold close that which they hold dear. And so the child will want to be dear to his parents. He will start using words of endearment. He will, he will want to matter to, to be significant to, uh, to be important to. These are the roots of what we call now self-esteem. But we miss the most significant fact of all is that we see the significance of ourselves in the eyes of those of, uh, that we're attached to. That's where we get a, a sense of who we matter to. Now, the literature on self-esteem uh, suggests uh, that, uh, that uh, what is most uh, important is, is what their friends think of, uh, of them. The problem was is this literature was pioneered around San uh, San Francisco, San Jose, and the whole area where peer orientation was at its height in the 1970s and 1980s. And so it simply assumed that peer should be the source of a sense of significance. Any child who's on trial to his peers is going to be insecure by default. That self-esteem will be subject to cancellation. Popularity has never been any uh, route to self-esteem. We've got a problem there. We are much safer in wanting to be dear and to matter and be significant to those who are responsible for themselves, for us. It doesn't always work well. I'm not saying that adult orientation serves every child. Uh, some adults are not in the best interests of children. Some peers have saved uh, their, their friends from adults. We have all kinds of exceptions, and you who are listening may be one of those exceptions. But I'm talking about how it was meant to be how it was meant to unfold if all things are well. Now, I've put this in gray here because this is a very vulnerable issue. Uh, the gray here is much more tentative. Uh, it, uh, it, it is huge risks. When you want to matter to somebody, you're deeply hurt by any sign of not mattering. And so it's very difficult to move into this territory. This is a deeper attachment, especially if it's personal when you want to matter to somebody. But if everything goes well here, and you have a sense of significance and mattering, and the four-year-old, he just loves stories of, of, of hearing uh, how important he is to you and how you could hardly wait till he was born. And he will want you to tell those stories over and over and over and over again because that means that you will hold him close. If you matter to him, it means that he is held on to, and that's what he wants to know. And if everything goes well at this time, at this level, 
of at the level of significance, and he feels somewhat secure in this. Then the limbic system pulls out all its stops. In the limbic system, the emotional brain is in charge of the unfolding of attachment. It actually orchestrates attachment as well as brain development, as we'll, as we'll learn later on, and I'm sure Gabor Maté will cover this. It's the limbic system, the, the center, the amygdala, the center of the emotional brain, and it is orchestrating this attachment as well, and it pulls out all the stops. Now, the problem uh, with emotion is that that's where we feel our vulnerability, that's where we can get hurt. And so it has to be safe to go down this level. But if, if it is safe enough, at that time, the child will give his heart to whomever he's attached to. Now the heart is a symbol of vulnerability, a heart is also a symbol of emotion, and it is in almost every language. And so it is very fitting that the child's art bec uh, becomes full of hearts, and that he draws hearts, and that he says to us in a most palpable way, Mommy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. Now, he could have said that as a two-year-old out of imitation, but now he says it from his heart. And if you liked Grandma before, now he loves Grandma. And if you liked his kitten before, now he absolutely loves the kitten. But when you give your heart away, you risk it being broken. It is a very vulnerable the, the vulnerability is palpable. Many kids today, as I was uh, through my private practice in parent consulting, uh, I, I would ask parents, when did your child give you his heart? They said, well, I'm not here to talk about it. I'm here to talk about a behavior. I'm here to talk about problems. I said, no, tell me, when did the child give you his heart? Well, what does that look like? Well, when, they, when did they say, I love you, and, 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 and their cards were full, full of hearts? And when did you feel that it went down into a very, very deep way? We call it emotional intimacy in, in attachment theory. Uh, when, when was it at this level? And, and, and I would have many say, I don't know. Is it important? I said, it's so important. You can't parent a child whose heart you do not have. You can't parent a teenager whose heart you do not have. Attachment is the context in which we raise children. And so many of our children are not even moving to this level. And they can't afford to give their hearts to each other because they are going to get broken. And how many times do hearts get broken and, and you still are in there? Then you go to more superficial levels. And this is the problem today, is children are not developing deep relationships. And we'll, later on, we'll talk about the digital world. This is a world of superficial attachment. This is not a world of emotional intimacy. It is a world obsessed with superficial conduct. This wouldn't even attract, and it doesn't attract those who are attached to the heart, who, who uh, have the emotional intimacy with their friends. It's not even, it's, they're not even interested in it. And yet, we're having very superficial attachment to being with and being the same and belonging. And finally, if everything goes well here, by the sixth year of life, a child will want to share all that is within his heart with others. He will want to be seen and heard from the inside. This is a full, going full round. Now, it's not only being seen and heard and being with. Now he wants to go from the inside out. Does somebody really get me? You can ask maybe a six-year-old girl, who are, you, who are you the closest to and why? Maybe it's uh, Aunt Emily. Why? Because she's the one who listens to me. She's the one uh, who, uh, who I tell my secrets to. And so very, at this stage, you define closeness by those who know you best. And we call that psychological intimacy. Sidney Girard discovered this in the 1970s, but he didn't know that it was, uh, that it was uh, related to attachment. And, and Albert Bandura, the father of social learning uh, theory, discovered social conformity at the second level, the sameness. Uh, in the 60s and 70s as well. But on his retirement, he was asked, basically, you know, what, what could you share with us? Uh, and he was the father of social learning theory. He said, I miss the main thing. I miss the very main thing of all, that you only seek to be like those to whom you're attached to. I didn't know about attachment theory. If I would have, uh, my theory would have been in attachment theory. So we have all kinds of blind sages who have had their theories but didn't know that they were talking about uh, the human need for contact and closeness for proximity. So this is what is meant to happen. Now, if this happens, this is, this is um, uh, what is meant to happen. If this happens, this creates the context. If the child gets what they're seeking for, uh, 
If the adults in their life can give a sense of belonging, a sense of significance, if they can hold on to the heart and make it safe, if they can give a sense of being known, this creates the womb of maturation, to change the metaphor a little bit. But it creates the womb. This is a context in which we are meant to grow up. This is the problem, is we're losing the context in which to raise children. And we're losing that context. Uh, and peer orientation is one of the reasons. It's not the only reason. But peer orientation is one of the reasons we are. Now, if all goes well, uh, then the potential, what does the potential look like? Now, again, when I taught university, I took a whole year uh, to speak to what the human potential looks like, a whole year course. Uh, again, we'll do this in five minutes. I cheated, took more than five minutes for the, uh, the, uh, the roots of attachment one, but I'll, I'll uh, be much quicker here uh, for the sake of time. The issue of, of uh, a developmentalist, the main issue is not behavior, and people get this wrong. Uh, we are not primarily concerned about whether people behave. What we're concerned is about whether children come to realize their full potential as human beings. The behavior will follow, but will they come to realize their full potential as human beings? And so the conditions, of course, have to do with that attachment, uh, but what does this potential look like? Well, if we walk all the way around it again, my life has been putting pieces of the puzzle together, and I've been doing this for 40 years. What it looks basically like is it has three sides. One side is a viable being. Uh, that you can act on your, that you can walk on your own two feet, so to speak, think for yourself, uh, be a separate person, uh, a viable being, uh, able to function apart from attachments. And this is true for all mammals. Uh, this becomes the yearning of the developmental process uh, to be able to function separately. So that's one, one way it looks. Another, a resilient being. Humans are the most adaptive of all creatures but it takes a process. And so we can adapt to the uh, circumstances we cannot control, uh, but it takes a process. We're able to handle adversity and, uh, and, uh, and adjust to change, in fact, much deeper than that, be transformed by that which we cannot change. And that is the key to resilience. And there's another aspect to it, that we, are become, become, uh, that we become a social being. Now, this doesn't mean get along. As a developmentalist, we don't mean here simply that we get along, that we're nice. And that's not it. Many of us are nice because we're downright neurotic. We're afraid of upset. Uh, those of us that are teachers, sometimes we're in our staff room and we're afraid to, to uh, say our mind uh, because we won't be liked. And so we're afraid to really uh, speak the truth uh, because it would be upsetting. And so we're quiet, and therefore everybody thinks we're nice, and we get along. And then we, we go out into the hallway of the school, and we tell the kids, come on, uh, you know, get along, being as neurotic as I am. Oh, that's, that's, not, that's not getting along. From a developmental point of view, getting along means something very, very special. It means the ability to do separateness without a loss of, of uh, togetherness, and the ability to do togetherness without the loss of separateness. Now, if you look at this, you realize that this is a challenge of marriage, is it not? How do you do togetherness without the loss of separateness? How do you do separateness without the loss of togetherness? You see, what is the challenge in that staff room? That challenge in that staff room is to be able to say what's on your mind to have integrity without the loss of diplomacy. It's to have diplomacy without the loss of integrity. That's not an easy matter. And you've got to have integrity first before you can get to diplomacy. That's the way it's grown. So you've got to first of all have a mind uh, before you can put it and have your own feelings before you can share it. But this is, this is the potential. The potential of the human creature is to be able to have togetherness without the loss of separateness, separateness without the loss of, of, um, of togetherness. And so this is the potential. And again, the idea is this is what development yearns for. If the conditions are conducive, this will happen spontaneously, but it is not inevitable. Psychological growth is not just a matter of age and stage. It's a matter of unfolding. And it's important to remember that this is the miracle and always has been. We have never been able to reproduce it. We can get people to act mature, and much of our effort in the school system now is trying to get children to act as if they care. That doesn't mean they care. 
to act as if they're responsible. That doesn't mean they feel responsibility. To act as if they're mature, that doesn't mean they do. In fact, we usually call people who act as if they care and don't truly care hypocrites. They don't have integrity, and that's what we're doing because we're no longer interested in true growth. We're interested in lookalikes. We are interested basically in getting, in, in getting the outcomes, behavioral outcomes, rather than true growth. And consider this. There's not one single pill that we've invented out of our thousands of pills that will help us grow up. Not one. And if growing up is a main issue in human development and in raising of children, if growing up is, if that is the issue, not diagnosis, not what's wrong with a child, what is their potential and how can it be realized? That is the main issue. That is the main issue. We mustn't stray from that. We're getting strayed from this. Is what is their potential as human beings? What are the conditions that are required to be able to realize it? And how can we as responsible adults provide those conditions? Then, then we begin to think uh, rightly about this. And so here, uh, true growth we find, like all true growth and even brain development, happens from a place of rest. It happens from a place of rest, not striving. And so the child must find rest from the pursuit of proximity. So the real issue becomes, how does a child become released from seeking contact and closeness, significance, uh, from love, from belonging? How does a child become released? Now, it's like hunger. It's like physical hunger. A child will never be released from the need, only the hunger momentarily. So how long can you release a child from physical hunger? Well, during the day, maybe two or three hours. How long can you release a child from attachment hunger? Probably the same. Most likely the same. What is the secret to it? Fulfilling the needs, fulfilling the hunger, being able to provide more than is pursued, uh, being able to give that sense of fulfillment. In the wake of that, you have got some energy that moves to the child becoming and realizing their own potential. And that is the key. It always has been the key. So the conditions that provide some rest include that the child experiences the provision of proximity greater than the pursuit. That child must feel taken care of. That child must experience that, uh, that mom and dad have more affection than is actually needed, more belonging, that the child is holding on to them, uh, that, uh, that there must be more than is, is pursued. The hug has to be greater than the child is going for. That sense of significance has to be greater. That's always the key uh, to that release. And here is the problems. When we look at when a child turns to his peers for the answers in life, for belonging, for significance, everything starts breaking down. That doesn't mean that all adults do this perfectly. It just means generally in society, where's your best bet? Where's your best bet? And it's not with one's peers, generally speaking. A child becomes capable of deeper and potentially more satisfying experience of connection and closeness. And so the roots have to go deep. But where they go deep, they're most likely to go deep in response to the adults, the grandparents, the uncles and aunts, the teachers who really can give a sense of caring. Uh, that's where they become deep. Now, the problem with peer orientation is that it impacts these. And there's two factors. The impact of peer orientation on development is through th uh, two factors. One is a flight from vulnerability. Uh, from this, we have to understand uh, the theory of human vulnerability. Uh, we've lost sight of this. This was all the theme of classic psychology of the theorists a hundred years ago. And we've lost sight of that, although neuroscience has come back to this. It is not informing the rest of our theories. And the other uh, is stuck in superficial seeking. That a child is stuck in superficial attachments, and this has great impact in terms of the context for raising them. And of course, the interaction between these two factors is huge. Now, a little bit on a flight from vulnerability. And again, the conclusion of all the depth psychologists, the psychodynamic psychologists, and basically the theme of this is, and, uh, it was, is that humans are very, very fragile creatures. We are very easily wounded, the literal meaning of vulnerable. We are easily wounded. Our, wounded, uh, our woundedness is in the fact that we are emotional creatures. It's in our feelings. And so we can get easily hurt. 
When we want to be with somebody, we get hurt by any sign that they do not want to be with us. When we give our heart to somebody, we get hurt by any, any sign of emotional coldness or distance. When we, want to, when we want somebody to get us, we get hurt uh, by any time they do not understand. They do not really see us uh, for who we are. And so we're easily hurt. And what Freud and all his colleagues said is basically the brain does not stand, except they didn't use the term brain then, they used the term mind. The mind does not stand idly by. If the vulnerability is more than can be borne, then defenses are erected to be able to defend against that vulnerability. And sometimes those defenses get stuck. And if they get stuck, this is huge implications. Now, neuroscience has isolated three different ways that the brain actually defends us. The numbing out of feelings, these are filters in the limbic system. It has a backup plan so we don't see what hurts us. These are huge attentional deficits, uh, defensive blindness. We simply don't see that which hurts us. And the most fundamental defense of all is to actually back out of attachment, uh, what Bowlby called defensive detachment. Uh, when, when being close to somebody sets us up for getting hurt, uh, we, uh, our brain can back us out of attachment uh, to resist contact and closeness. And many children are doing this now. Now, what, what renders a child more likely to be defended uh, than another? Two factors emerge in the literature. Uh, one is their inherent sensitivity. Uh, some children are more inherently sensitive. The more sensitive you are, the more easily affected. The more easy, easily affected, the more easily wounded. And uh, the things that control that are genetics and things like prenatal and birth experiences. These also are thresholds for sensitivity are set during that time. Uh, and uh, then the other factor, of course, is wounding. And the biggest wounds, the things that actually cause the cortisol to go up, and we can measure these now. Uh, what causes the cortisol to go up? We can measure in the saliva uh, these things. Uh, separation, when a child faces separation from those attached to, uh, feels shame as if there is something wrong with one, and feels too alarmed. And remarkably now, it used to be thought that the family was the primary source of stress. And all the research was on the family. And today's literature has zeroed in on peer interaction as being the primary source of wounding. Our children have never been interacting with each other more. Even if they want to interact with each other, the issue is, is this is where they experience most the facing separation, shame, and feeling alarmed. Now the thing about this is, is that these defenses equip a person, especially if, if they get stuck, to be in a wounding environment. Some of you as adults, I remember when it, my, my kids first of all became teenagers, and I walked the halls of high school again. And I walked the halls of high school and wondered how in the world could I even take it? It felt like I could not be there. The, it, the woundingness, the, the, the way the eyes looked, uh, the, the cliques, the rejection, I just, how in the world? And I remembered, oh yeah, I kind of got a bit numbed out. My brain had to defect me, it, it, to protect me, and it does, to be able to equip us for a wounding environment. How would we even interface on Facebook? We have to be equipped for a wounding environment. Uh, the defenses go up, and as the defenses go up, the kids look less distressed. But peer interaction is a major source of wounding. Now, nature still has a plan. Even if we're in a wounding environment, it's, there is a, a better way that we can be shielded from it, a better way. Now, when I went to school, Mrs. Ackerberg's class was, was also Nick, Jim, and Butch. They were the three school bullies. There was Holly too, but she didn't bother me. She just bothered the girls. Because I did well at school, I was put down. I was uh, criticized, called names. Because there were ditches around, uh, they tried to uh, put me in the ditch. And because my mother made good lunches, uh, the bullies, as they usually do, uh, would like to take it for their own until my mother figured out to make two lunches, uh, one for the bullies and one for me. But when I look back at this, I don't feel too scarred by it. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Emotionally, my brain hasn't numbed me out or tuned me out. I, I believe 
that my mother and Mrs. Ackerberg saved me from this, saved me from this experience. Why? Well, the research now says that the most significant factor in shielding a child against external wounds is that child's attachment to the adult. That child's attachment. Why? 90,000 adolescents, first of all, the basic research on this, 90,000 adolescents in the National Longitudinal Study of, of Adolescent Health. I, I talk about this research in my book, Hold On to Your Kids. It's a longitudinal study. Every year, the question is, what is the most significant factor in keeping children emotionally safe uh, at school, away from high-risk activity, uh, basically realizing their potential as human beings, and the single factor is a strong emotional connection with a caring adult. Why is that? Because when I gave my heart to Mrs. Ackerberg, what she thought of me mattered much more than what, Jig, what Nick, Jim, and Butch thought of me. And that protected me. Now, it didn't protect me from being pushed around. It didn't protect me from being called names. What it did is it meant my brain didn't have to defend me through numbing out and tuning out. It meant I was able to take it because it wasn't the most significant. What they thought of me was not the most important. That's the way children are meant to be shielded. The problem is, is when they become peer-oriented, they lose the shield that was meant to protect them from a wounding world. Now, some of us were protected from our attachments with grandma or with grandpa or an aunt, but we knew we were important and significant, and that enabled us to go through all kinds of abuse and all kinds of things that didn't work. Why? Because we were protected. It only takes one attachment. We were protected. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't get hurt. What it means is our brain doesn't have to defend us at a more critical way because the costs are tremendous when that happens. And so the most significant factor in keeping children safe and in softening their hearts so they can feel their emotions, a soft heart and intuitive language, is to be protected to have the shield that's why children need to be attached to us so that we can protect them in a wounding world all our money is being now given uh, into safe school programs anti-bullying programs is going in the wrong direction we have never been able to keep children safe by trying to get them to get along with each other, by teaching empathy and caring and any of those things. We've always been able to keep children safe because the adults in their life mattered more than the peers. If we don't get that part, we're not going to have a ghost of a chance. We've got to get that part. And so they need to. I was protected by Mrs. Ackerberg. I was protected because I gave my heart to my mother. If you have some adults that you can attach to, they will enable you to live through the kind of wounding environments. And that is what is, is necessary now. Uh, that allows uh, us, the emotions, us to be able to feel our emotions. Now, peer-oriented kids become defended against the vulnerability of their experience for a number of reasons. Again, as we review here, they become sensitized to the insensitive relating of their peers. It matters more. And children were never meant to be responsible for each other. For us to now teach uh, social responsibility and social learning and make them responsible for each other, it, that is not what they were meant to be. We were meant to be responsible for them. Uh, they lose their most effective shield against external stress, a safe attachment with adults. And signs of vulnerability are oft, often, uh, um, are often shamed or exploited by peers. Uh, in the peer culture, in the youth culture, invulnerability is venerated. Look at their movies. Look at their entertainment. And there is no room for vulnerability of any kind. Uh, and so it is a flight from vulnerability. And this flight from vulnerability adversely affects attachment. That is, you can't move deep into attachment. When there's a flight from vulnerability, you lose the capacity for psychological and emotional intimacy. It skews towards depersonalized attachment. Uh, towards attachment towards things, towards attachment fixes, like winning, uh, like uh, Nintendo games, like electronic games. Uh, it, it is all about fixations, about placing, and so on. It becomes depersonalized, hoarding, uh, attachment to, uh, to things. This is depersonalized attachment energy, even the pursuit of reward. We now know that reward works through the attachment mechanisms in the brain. 
And so in the using of a ward or the happy face, it's a depersonalized attachment. That's an addictive form of attachment energy. We are meant to be attached to individuals. That's the only place that we can get fulfilled. Our children need to be attached to those adults that are responsible for them. It skews towards superficial attachment and away from emotional and psychological intimacy. The quest for sameness, of course, if a child is stuck at a quest for sameness, it will favor peer attachments. They'll attach to whomever it seems that they are the most the same as, and this will favor peer attachments. If we look at this and we take away from the deeper attachments, and the least vulnerable of all is a quest for sameness. When I worked with delinquents, uh, this was the most pronounced for them, uh, this quest for sameness. This will favor automatically attaching to their peers. And so we've got a problem there. And then it renders children insatiable uh, because the, the fact is, is to get any kind of fulfillment whatsoever, the, the nurturance has to sink in. It has to sink in that you matter to somebody, that somebody invites you to exist in their presence, the most wonderful invitation. We all look for this. My wife can say, I love you to me, and sometimes when I'm not in a place of my own vulnerability to feel my wounds, it's very nice. I prefer it than to not have it. And I say, I love you too, and it, it, it's, it's, it's okay, it's good, but it doesn't move me. But when I'm in that place where I can actually feel my wounds, my feelings, when I'm in the place where I'm, I'm open at that place of vulnerability, and she says, Gordon, I love you, it goes in deep. It goes in deep, it moves me. That's a place of fulfillment. But for that, to be able to feel fulfilled, I also have to be capable of feeling the other feelings that go along with it. This is a whole issue of human vulnerability. And in the flight from vulnerability, nothing is fulfilling. And if it's not fulfilling, it's addictive. If something doesn't go down, it's like a soother. A soother can't fulfill. It can titillate the senses, but it doesn't fulfill. And when we're speaking to the most important needs of all, attachment, and it doesn't fulfill, it sets up for the addiction. And we now know that, that addiction, digital connectivity through the digital means, connectivity through digital means is now, that is texting and uh, social media, is more addictive according to a recent research uh, study than alcohol and tobacco. It is addictive. Our children are suffering from huge addiction. They are no longer in control. It renders children equipped to engage in wounding interaction and, functions, uh, and function in wounding environments, and that is a problem. Uh, there are also uh, huge uh, implications uh, from the interaction, uh, and, and one is simply developmental arrest. They get stuck. They don't mature, and this is one of the great concerns, is our children are not realizing their potential. It's very interesting that in the 1960s, when we started taking uh, suicide rates, uh, that since the 1960s until now, uh, that suicide has increased threefold among children, fourfold for 10 to 14 year olds. Uh, in the recent decade, it's decreased a little bit, but it's increased with girls. Uh, and so it, we have this. Now, this has paralleled the problems with peer orientation. I'm convinced the two are related. I'm convinced the ones that we've seen suicide most in terms of later to bullying and other things were because peers mattered more to them than the adults in their life. This is a thing that's never said. It's never said. Because it wasn't working with their peers and so we blame the peer interaction. But wait a minute. Why weren't the adults more important? We didn't hold on to them. We aren't holding on to our kids. They need us, even in adolescence, even more in adolescence, because it's a wounding world there. Uh, I teach a three-day course across Canada on aggression, uh, and uh, I, I will just introduce the main model here that I put together through words, uh, through, uh, through the years, uh, just to show this. Um, the eruptions of attacking energy are the end of a traffic circle, so to speak. The roots of aggression are in the emotion of frustration, something not working for us. We've known this since the frustration-aggression hypothesis in 1939. 
But what Dollard and Miller said at that time is that there must be other outcomes to aggression that are more civilized, outcomes to frustration rather, that are more civilized than aggression. And, and civilized behavior lies in being able to further those outcomes. Very simply, in putting the, the things together, when we're frustrated, our first impulse is to affect change. But there's many things that we cannot change. Time, other people's invitation to us to exist, that they want to be with us, uh, we, we, uh, to be best at everything, uh, to send the sibling back from whence he came, and we could go on and on and on about the things. We can't get our way all the time and so on. And so we encounter futility when we're up against the things that we cannot change. Well, this is a human journey. Whatever we can't change should be able to change us and transform us from the inside out. But this is only when the futility sinks in. And this is the process of adaptation. So we are meant to become transformed by that which we cannot change, but it's not inevitable again. And it turns out that futility is the experience that has to sink in. And it also turns out that when futility sinks in, when the amygdala registers futility, that in a young child, signals are sent to the lacrimal glands, actually they are in all of us, but in a young child they're very transparent and we see it. Signals are sent to the lacrimal gland and the eyes water. And so tears of futility have been a symbol of adaptation, human transformation, recovery and healing for eons. The Greeks called the big futilities in life tragedies. And the tears were a symbol of that tragedy. When you came to terms with those things that you cannot change, you come to the tears of sadness and disappointment. Now humans cry over all kinds of things. Onions, pain. We can even cry in response to joy and sometimes I have tears when my wife says I love you. It moves me. And so we tend to have tears over these things, but the tears of futility are very, very distinct. And in a research lab in Minneapolis, they find out it has a very distinct chemical composition, most likely a result of us going from a state of work, the sympathetic nervous system, to a state of rest, the parasympathetic nervous system, where we come to terms with the things that we cannot change. And so that's a human adaptation. So it ends up that, adapta that aggression Aggression is a, a manifestation that a child, an adult, has not yet had his tears, at least on the inside, not had his sadness and disappointment about the things he cannot change in his life. Aggression is escalating in our society. It's telling us that frustration is increasing. That is among children. Uh, uh, Self-attacks, attacks towards others, and so on. It's telling us that their frustration is increasing it's also telling us that the adapt adaptation isn't. But tears, it's not safe to cry around peers. Nowadays, the only, only thing you're allowed to cry about is if you lose the Stanley Cup. In Vancouver, there weren't nearly enough tears last time. And so we had the riots. Or if somebody dies in your high school, and then everybody cries, even those who have no idea of who this person is, because our kids have such a sea of tears inside of them that there is no outlet for in our society, no room in the pure culture. It is a tearless culture, an absolutely tearless culture. No wonder the aggression is escalating. Because when you don't have those tears, tears are very vulnerable things when there's no room for them. And then we have the problem with aggression. And now, Nature still has another way. Uh, by the time you're five to seven years of age and your prefrontal cortex has got up and running, it means that if you have the impulse to hit, to fight, to scream, to yell, it's supposed to call forth the opposite impulse or idea of that, but that would get me in trouble, uh, but I love her, and so on. And so it's supposed to be hemmed in by ambivalence, by mixed feelings. But this takes time. Uh, it's uh, five to seven years of age is when the prefrontal cortex even starts getting wired up and so that we can have our, our mixed feelings. And that's why most children will grow out of aggression between five and seven years of age. Uh, but the problem is, is the feelings that temper aggression, uh, that mix are very vulnerable feelings. And in the flight from vulnerability, our children are losing them. They're losing their feelings of shame. They're losing their feelings of alarm. Many of them no longer say, I miss. They don't say, I'm scared. And uh, they're not showing the vulnerable feelings. And so we've got a problem this way. And so pure orientation tends to be a recipe for aggression. 
they are expressing themselves, their aggression, in, in ways that are not part of established uh, society. Uh, their frustration is heightened, their encounters with futility are more, uh, their flight from vulnerability is greater, and this is an absolutely recipe for aggression. Let me go on. Uh, there is more alarm problems. We're having a huge escalation in anxiety problems, in agitation problems, and adrenaline-seeking problems, all, all related to the underlying aspect of alarm. A uh, large part of our brain is committed to an alarm system. Uh, we have individuals now, neuroscientists, studying that alarm system, uh, uh, such as Joseph Ledoux in Emotional Brain. And it ends up that, these, that we need, for the alarm to move us to caution, we need to be able to have our feelings. That is not to be defended against vulnerability. Now the problem is, when children become attached to each other, what alarms us most is facing separation. And when they become attached to each other, they face more separation than they should face. They're facing separation all the time. When you're on Facebook, you're facing separation all the time. Who likes me, who doesn't? Rejection, etc. it's there all the time. And so what happens is the, our child are becoming alarmed, uh, the probabilities of those. There's three basic kinds of alarm problems depending upon how defended the child is. The normal kind is simply anxiety, where we simply don't know. We feel unsafe, but we don't know what it is that's alarming us. Uh, the separation is too much to see. And so we have the anxiety problems, and these are escalating. The signs include not feeling safe, anxiety-reducing behavior, phobias, nightmares, obsessions, compulsions, panic attacks, and so on. At a deeper level, though, and this is escalating among our children and youth, are the agitation problems here. The big thing about this is children no longer say, I'm scared, but everything else in them says they are alarmed. And so they're actually defended against the feelings of alarm. And so the signs include not talking about feeling scared, not talking about being nervous. Uh, they are very agitated, though. There's hyperness or tension. There's restlessness. There's recklessness. They're not moved to caution. They can't stay out of harm's way. They don't see trouble coming. They're impulsive, and they're scattered in their attention. And then we're having a whole new uh, group of problems which we never had before. And that is where, where the alarm system becomes perverted. Instead of being moved to caution, uh, children are actually courting. Uh, uh, they're actually uh, attracted to what alarms. Uh, they're cutting themselves. Uh, to cut yourself provokes the alarm system. When there's no vulnerability, it actually gives you an adrenaline rush. And we have a, a whole generation of adrenaline seekers. Our adolescent wards are being filled with female cutters, not only in Canada and the in, in United States, but also in Germany and in Northern Europe. And so our, our children are in trouble this way. Again, to me, it is no accident that these, these problems have escalated uh, parallel to peer orientation in our society. We have resistance and oppositionality, of course. It comes out why it is that children need to be attached to those responsible for them, is that attachment, the most powerful force in the universe, is what renders children receptive to being told what to do. It renders them receptive to being taken care of. I use this in much of my material. It, attachment facilitates dependence. It renders receptive. It's also the secret of what gives us our power, not our know-how, not our knowledge, but the relationship. And the first thing it does is it arranges hierarchically. We'll talk about that more in the session on bullying because this is the whole key to the bullying, understanding the bullying, is a hierarchical nature of attachment. Uh, if the purpose is to, is to take care of, uh, then it needs to facilitate the caretaking instincts from the receiving instincts, the alpha instincts from the dependent instincts. And that allows us to take care of them. Um, and it allows us to take charge of our children, to take care of them, to act with natural authority. Uh, also, attachment endears us to each other. Uh, it is absolutely, when we get close to each other, we need something to cover the foul smells, the bad habits, the irritations. If any of you have ever experienced a falling out of love with someone, it will have occurred to you, when you've fallen out of love with them, how actually irritating that person is, and how you never realized it before. The fact is, is they didn't change. 
your relationship to them changed. That's how many sensitive people can realizing, you know, honey, you don't love me anymore. Well, what do you mean? You don't have the patience you used to have because attachment covers all of those kinds of things. Your teachers don't have to dress as if they're cool because when you're attached to that teacher, Mrs. Ackerberg was beautiful to me. I can't remember how she actually looked, but I was attached to her, and that's all that matters. Um, so it renders endearing uh, and tolerant, and that's important. I'll never forget. I'll never forget the experience. I have uh, five kids and three grandkids. My first grandchild, I was so thrilled, so thrilled. I was so proud. It just leave her with me. Leave Carol with me. I'll change her diapers and so on and so on. I changed thousands of diapers having five kids. There was no problem. One time, my daughter Tamara said to me, well, can I, uh, my fr friend and I are going shopping. Uh, she has a baby too. Can I leave the baby? I said, well, sure. Uh, leave the diapers and so on and so on. Okay. It never occurred to me. It never occurred to me that attachment had a lot to do with, with this process. I got sick to my stomach. <laughs> Absolutely sick to my stomach. And pardon my language here, but it's just basically rural farming language. But if attachment can make shit smell sweet, <laughs> it can do most anything. It can do most anything. But the problem is, when children fall out of attachment with us, they no longer have any patience with us. And we no longer, when we fall out of attachment with them, we have no patience with them. We need that. We need that. Again, this was what was meant to be. It creates a sense of home. Every child needs to feel at home. They need to feel at home at school, not with their peers, but with their teachers. They need to feel at home with mom and dad. That allows us to take care of them. Uh, that allows us uh, to have a place of retreat. But what if we've been replaced by a child's peers? Who are they at home with? Over the years, hundreds of parents have come to me with t teenagers that have run away from home. I used to work a lot with delinquents. And they would say, the child has run away from home. And I would say often, children don't run away from home. Children run to home. We're creatures of attachment. Tell me whom your children are attached to, and I'll tell you who they ran to. It's not hard. They need to be at home with us. We need to be their home. That's a matter of attachment. It creates a compass point, as I said before, but only attachment creates a home. A home is not a house. A home is not of bricks and stone, uh, of wood. A home is a place of attachment. Uh, it creates a compass point which allows us to command their attention, guide and direct them, and transmit our culture. These, the attachment, are the transmission lines of culture. So if they're more attached to their peers, whose culture are they getting? Who commands their attention? Who are they looking to? Again, it is a reason they need to be attached to the adults responsible for them. It activates proximity instincts, which keeps children close. It means that we can take the mother goose position and have confidence that our children are following us. Nowadays, it's not like this. If you go back to the Judith Harris uh, picture on the front, it's not only that the peers are following the peers, but we're busy following them. We've lost our lead. Nowadays, the saddest thing that you can see is in a kindergarten class or, or a, a junior kindergarten class is when all the kids are, 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 have to hold hands or have to hold something like that because there's no confidence that the mother hen is in the lead. We've lost the attachment. We've lost the understanding that children were meant to orbit around us. We're meant to be able to walk with confidence in the mother goose position. Because, but we only follow those to whom we are attached. And so if we want our children, if we want our lead, our children, and the most important things, and by the way, in education, even the word pedagogue means leader of children. And if we're going to be a true leader and lead them in their learning, it's an attachment-based thing. They need to be attached to us. To open their minds to our teaching, we have to have their hearts first. It is, again, the context for being able to do this. And then finally, it evokes the desire to be good for those attached to. This is huge. We all want children to be good. We say it in various ways. That isn't the issue. The issue is, and I'd often say to parents and teachers, no, that would be, well, how do I get my child to do his homework? How do I get him to do this? How do I get him to clean up his room? How does that? And I would say, well, do you feel the desire of your child to be good for you? They said, well, I'm not here to talk about that. 
I'm here to get how, how to get them to behave. I said, I'll ask again. Do you feel within your, your heart, your child's heart, the desire to be good for you? Well, I guess not, but I told him a thousand times not to do this. I said, I know you want your child to be good for you. What I don't know is if your child wants to be, your child wants to be good for you. Because that is the primary motivation. We only feel like being good for those to whom we're attached to. We weren't meant to raise children whose hearts we did not have. We weren't meant to teach children whose hearts we do not have. We have resorted to all kinds of tricks with our children, all kinds of things because we don't have enough natural attachment power to do our job. When we use these tricks, we insult the relationship. If our friends use tricks with us, no, I'd like you to do this for me next week, but I'm afraid you might say no. So I just want you to know that I won't do this for you if you won't do that for me. We would be insulted because a friendship is attachment. And we must believe in attachment that we'd want to make things work for each other, be good for each other. We can't always make it happen, but that's it. When we act as if a child does not want to be good for us, we insult the relationship. Why would any child want to be attached to us? We've taken a dreadful turn. And the problem is, is when kids attach to each other, when they attach to their peers, who, they, who do they want to be good for? Who are they obeying? Who are their instincts to make things work for? You see, this needs to be us. It's all we need to do the parenting. Parenting was meant to be natural. Teaching was meant to be natural. It's all we need. We've resorted to tricks because we don't have enough natural power. We're losing it to their peers. Uh, and so they're full of resistance and opposition, what I call, call counter will, because uh, after a, a theorist, Otto Rank, a psychologist 100 years ago, because our will is the greatest force imposing upon children, and their instinct is to resist it. Now, get this. What we've discovered and what Otto Rank discovered, and what we know in attachment theory, is that children by default are difficult. Right? By default, they're difficult. That is, by default, they're not meant to do our, our, our bidding. If you take a three-and-a-half-year-old and, -year -old and uh, use somebody else's for this experiment... And uh, you uh, make sure that you don't say their name, make sure they don't know you, make sure that you don't look at them or smile at them or anything like this. You have to get behind them. Maybe you put a piece of scrap paper on the floor and you start the interaction by being coercive. Not mean, just coercive. Pick up that paper right now. Now what that three and a half year old, if she has any spunk whatsoever, what should happen is this. Don't you tell me what to do, you're not my mommy. Which is precisely the point. What she can't tell you, of course, which is absolutely self-evident to her, but she has no words for, excuse me, I'm not designed by nature to take orders from anyone I am not attached to, which is precisely the problem. We are diagnosing more and more children with resistance, oppositional, defiant, oppositional disorder. I have never seen and there has never been any evidence that there is something wrong with their brains. There's something awfully wrong with a society, out of order of a society, who thinks they can boss children around who are not attached to them. Because it automatically pushes the wrong buttons. In fact, if you do not engage the attachment instincts the first thing in the morning before you wake a child up, and you say, hurry up, it will make them feel like slowing down. If you say to a child before you've engaged the attachment instincts, if you say to them, okay, I can't let you do this, or, or don't touch the fireplace utensils, they'll feel like doing this. So were you trying to give me a message here? Oh, 20 minutes. Yeah, I, I got it here. Uh, so counter will happens. We're only meant, again, that's why attachment is meant to be the context. The point here is, the point here is, is that nature automatically protected us against being influenced by anybody we're not attached to. Now that would revolutionize our education and daycare and the whole way we do parents. That would revolutionize the concept of step parenting, foster parenting. You can't just step into parenting. Why? Because the child may not have any attachment that makes it work. You see, there's no such thing as a substitute teacher, and many of you teachers know that. Why? Because that teacher might do exactly the same thing as you, say the same words, but if that child is not attached to the teacher, it has a completely opposite effect. 
Attachment is everything. Attachment is the context for raising those children. And so counterwill happens when the pressure experienced is greater than the pursuit of proximity, when the commands are greater than the impulse to comply, the obligations are greater than the urge to make it work, the expectations greater than the desire to please, the demands are greater than the inclination to defer. My grade two teacher I was not attached to and whatever she wanted me to do, I felt like doing the opposite. She made the mistake of saying not to play tag on top of the desks, it had never occurred to me before, but I found myself doing it. She pushed all the wrong buttons in me. And I thought from grade one, I thought I was a good boy and a smart boy, and I didn't realize the goodness wasn't in my nature. The goodness was in my relationship to my teacher, to my mother. I wasn't as attached to my father, so it didn't bring out the same instincts to me. It wasn't in my nature. We all have instincts to be good and instincts to be bad. But again, we only feel like being good for those to whom we're attached. When children are attached to their peers, that's where their instincts are going. And guess who gets the resistance? The adults in their life. That's why parenting and teaching is getting harder and harder. When the pressure is greater than the desire to measure up, when the forcefulness is greater than the desire to be good. The other implications are bullying problems, which we'll talk about later. Uh, this is also an attachment aberration, and I'll explain it in a later uh, session. Hypersexualized relating. Peer relationships were the only relationships meant to be sexualized uh, because that's where procreation occurs. Uh, you're not meant to sexualize your hierarchical relationships, otherwise it would really ruin us, uh, ruin it for being able to take care of kids. The problem when kids become uh, peer-oriented very early, their whole attachment becomes sexualized as well. And this is the biggest uh, ex explanation for why our children are becoming hypersexualized, is that attachment is, is uh, taking a sexual turn is because of the peer orientation and the digital addictions, again, we'll talk about more in a later session, is that this is where they connect with each other, but the connection is too superficial, so there's never any fulfillment or satiation. The more they do, the more they have, the, uh, the uh, more they want. That, uh, that these, their connections with each other uh, are, are not fulfilling. And tribalization is occurring, and this is absolutely ironic that in an age of globalization, we are in Canada uh, facing increasing tribalization. Gang formation is actually increasing. Cliques, uh, problems in the schools is actually increasing. Why? Uh, it's very simple. Attachment, like any force in the universe, uh, is for any force, there's an equal and opposite force uh, that is it's like magnetism. Uh, for every pursuit of proximity, there is an equal and opposite resistance to proximity. That is the way it's polarized. Now, the reason for this polarization, it often happens uh, around uh, five, six months of age, is very clear from an attachment perspective. Uh, why is it? Uh, the reason for the polarization around five or six months of age when you have stranger protest, uh, you have separation protest, is to be able to protect existing attachments. Nature says, thank you very much. We had attachments that we need. Now we've got to go deeper. And so when a stranger comes up to you, you're holding the baby. Uh, they shy away from them, don't feel like looking at them, smiling at them, uh, and so on, and engage in this as stranger protest. Now this is there, uh, they, and uh, this helps explain why we do have uh, the issues of stranger protest, and also this explains shyness. And unfortunately, shyness has become pathologized as social anxiety disorder because then people don't understand attachment. It doesn't, it's, we're never shy with those whom we're attached to. We shy away from contact and closeness with those to whom we're not attached to. It doesn't feel right to talk to, to look at them. Uh, and so this is, this is the problem. The problem is, is that when children become attached to peers, who are they shying away from? The adults who are responsible for them. And here we have a problem. And also, uh, we have a problem when in the, we have the polarization of the negative energy on the dark side of attachment. There is a dark side to attachment of negative polarity. They're resisting our, our high schools and our, our uh, elementary schools are being filled with this dark side of energy because it's less vulnerable. And so all kinds of disowning, opposing, and training, holding, and contempt, the prisons were filled with this. And now our high schools are being filled with this. We think it's because children haven't been taught to care. They don't know empathy. Uh-uh. It's because their attachment instincts are out of line. 
if there were proper attachment, uh, if it was there, you would see a much more vulnerable way of attaching. But their attachment instincts and these kids tribalize. And so it explains the gang formation of, of, as well. The causes of peer orientation. Uh, premature exposure to peers is a big one, a very big one. Uh, it's and by premature before, uh, they have developed the capacity for emotional and psychological intimacy, uh, which enables them to hold on to their parents and teachers when physically apart. And by premature also means uh, um, when uh, uh, that uh, premature that uh, when they're attaching primarily to sameness, uh, they will favor peer orientation, and so they need to go to the deeper intimacies that are there. And uh, when, when, uh, uh, when they are not revolving around the adults in charge of them, uh, the failure of matchmaking in our society, uh, this is absolutely essential. And this is what's changed in our society, is generally speaking, uh, they were revolving around the adults uh, uh, responsible for them. Or when uh, the peers are not psychologically enough uh, or mature enough to be able uh, to hold on to themselves when interacting with their peers. So what happens in our society uh, quite often is, uh, is that we drop a child off, four, five, six, seven-year-old off, and they're not deep enough attached to us to be able to hold on to us when apart. And so we drop them off, and this is intolerable for the attachment brain. And so often there's a lot of peers in the picture, and the attachment brain will go hunting for something to hold on to, uh, to attach to because of the separation that is there. And, uh, of course, uh, they are more likely to see their peers. They look the same as, as them and so on. And they attach them. But what isn't, what isn't seen, what isn't apparent in this is what happens next. The parent or the teacher comes back into this. And I also have this research in Hold On to Your Kids. And this teacher is resisted. The teacher is resisted. The, this child, who now looks like he's far more sociable, is actually much more difficult to manage. And so we have the resistance that is, is there. Other causes of peer orientation, a widening cultural gap between children and adults, which is making it increasingly difficult for children to hold on to both simultaneously. In times past, peers and adults dressed alike, they talked alike, they had the same values. That's not true now. Uh, we're a culture apart. A failure to engage as well as to preserve a uh, sense of connection with the children in our care. We're not, we're not engaging their attachment instincts. We're not in, uh, collecting them. We've lost the rituals to do this. We need to find these back. And the allure of the first fruits of peer orientation. Now, I just want to take a uh, few minutes about this, but this is what I believe is huge. It, peer orientation comes like a Trojan horse, a godsend. Its first effects are amazing. When children play with their peers, adults get emancipated. Peers are the best babysitter ever. So my goodness, now finally we can get on with things because they're not revolving around us. Now our children are not bored. But we don't realize that this is not the answer to boredom. The answer to boredom is something emerging from the inside. It just camouflages this place. And so we say, go play with your friends. Uh, we think that they'll get greater self-esteem because they need to be with their friends to be able to be liked and so on. We don't realize it sets them up for getting hurt and wounded and insecurity. Uh, we think that they belong and, and fit with each other this way. And again, it's our own peer orientation. And we think this is the answer to learning to get along, uh, that they need to socialize with each other and then they'll get along. We think it has to do with practice rather than development. In actual fact, uh, kids are like, are like the planets in the universe. The answer to the planets in the universe, if they ever started revolving around each other, we'd have chaos in the universe. The answer to the planets in the universe and to getting along is to each be a, the primary attachment is the sun. As long as the primary attachment is sun, is the sun, we're okay. We'll have harmony in the universe. And that is in the family. Unless you are the primary attachment of each of your children, if they start revolving around each other, you've got problems. As a teacher, if, you're, if, the ch if the children are orbiting around you, there's far less pressure on them. They will get along because they matter less to each other. 
But the issue is not their relationships with each other. It's a relationship with the adults. Uh, the way it was meant to be is, is basically that the primary attachment of all children was the adults that were responsible. And that way, uh, that way we form a village of consistent attachments uh, in there. And uh, let's see if I can get this thing to revolve. Oh, it will revolve for me. Yes, I, I love PowerPoint, can do it sometimes, not always, but it is there. The allure goes on. Peer-oriented kids appear more sociable. And the only reason is, is because they lose their shyness with each other. But they become more rude to adults. They're not more sociable. We've mistaken this. We've mistaken this. They appear more schoolable. That is because they have more, less separation anxiety. Uh, and so anxiety can dumb you, the, uh, dumb you down tremendously. It's because they are less shy. So initially, they're more schoolable. But the research shows by four years of age, uh, children uh, start losing all of this benefit. And they start uh, losing it. Why? Because they're not paying attention to their teachers. They're paying attention to their peers. Uh, so in the early years, they appear more schoolable. Uh, but the adult-oriented children finish less. Uh, or f finish last, rather. Uh, uh, Peer-oriented kids appear less dependent, but they're, no, they're not less dependent. They're more dependent upon their peers, which gives them the illusion of being independent to us. As long as they're dependent, they need to be dependent upon those who are responsible for them. And they appear less distressed because in the flight from vulnerability, the first thing that happens is you no longer talk about what bothers you. And when a child no longer talks about what bothers them, we assume that they're not bothered. Because when children are healthy, when they're emotionally healthy, they complain a whole lot. They're noisy. Mommy so-and-so hurt my feelings. I don't like it that he doesn't like me, and so on. When children get quiet is when we have to worry. We are absolutely biased to talk about what distresses us. When we get too defended, we don't. But these children look tough. They look resilient. And so we like the children who don't complain, who look tough, uh, etc. The problem is, is they're that way because they've been defended against it. They need soft hearts, not hard hearts. What blinds us to peer orientation, our own peer orientation, uh, again, as I said, we're into the third generation. Uh, it's normality because it is so common and our tendency to confuse what is normal with what is natural. Uh, this is not the way it was meant to be. And our mistaken assumption that socializing leads to socialization. When we look at the literature, the more children spend with each other, the less they integrate into society. Socializing does not lead to socialization. Healthy development does. They don't need each other, they need us. And the simplistic idea that interfacing with equals or interacting with equals will lead to egalitarian values. We have this simplistic notion, and I'll overstate it as Canadians. We have this simplistic notion that if we can get our kindergarten children relating to each other, their equals around round tables in kindergarten, they will spontaneously develop egalitarian values, and all will be well, and democracy will be preserved. It doesn't work that way. As soon as they attach to each other, they do not spontaneously evolve in egalitarian interaction. They spontaneously evolve in hierarchical interaction. They spontaneously play hierarchical games, slaves and masters, owners and pets, and all the hierarchical games you can. Why? Because attachment is naturally hierarchical. This is not the answer to egalitarian values, and so we've gone wrong. Children require strong attachments to the adults responsible for them, strong attachments, and that's the conclusion. We must have our children's hearts uh, in order to shield them from a wounding world, in order to render them receptive to our care and instruction, in order to shoehorn them into our society. We are their best bet in an order to give birth to their individuality. And when you look at this, when you look at nature's answer here, the answer to not being with all the time is to be the same as. But there's no room for individuality. And so the answer there is to have a sense of belonging, 
but, uh, but we need to be able to not always agree with, to have a sense of loyalty. And so there we have a sense of mattering, which answers to that. There's room, the deeper the attachment, the more room for individuality. And so even adolescents need to be deeply attached to the adults responsible for them, for them to have room to be able to grow their true personalities. The answer is not less attachment, the answer is more. Uh, the, the deeper they're attached, uh, the better that, uh, that uh, that will be there. Now, relationships that should be encouraged then, uh, relationships with parents and family, uh, relationships with other caregivers to the child's life, daycare providers, preschool teachers, babysitters, family workers, uh, their nannies. We need to do the matchmaking. We need to create the village that children are meant to be raised in. Relationships with agents of socialization, grandparents, uncles and aunts. In other words, we should be in the relationship building, uh, uh, building uh, um, uh, endeavors. Hierarchical relationships between children, not peer relationships, hierarchical relationships. And the relationships with peers that do not compete or conflict with those above. Now, don't children need their peers? Don't children need their peers after all of this? Do they not? They do play a role in development, but if we look at the master blueprint, we look at the role, this comes at the end of development, not at the beginning. At the beginning is attachment to parents and other adults responsible for the child. This is clearly the womb of maturation. And what is to replace this? I often get asked, well, shouldn't peers replace parents? Absolutely not. Who, what is meant to replace parents? Always we've known this in development. A child's sense of self, their own person. They're meant to emerge to become their own person so that then when they interact with their peers, they are able to relate to their peers without loss of individuality or loss of adult attachment. In adolescence is meant the emergence into personhood. If they can hold on to themselves, then they are ready to interact with each other. That is absolutely essential. That's what we're forgetting. And when children come too soon to replace us with peers, what gets lost is their personhood, their individuality. Peer orientation crushes individuality. And so the bottom line is, as the title of the book is, we need to hold on to our kids. We need to hold on to them. We hold on to them by making it easy for them to fall into attachment with us. We must not hold attachment against them. By providing a touch of proximity in all the ways of significance, of mattering, of belonging, uh, so that we are their nurturers in their life and they will feed at our table. By bridging whatever could divide, we need to hold on to them by bridging the separations, by putting the focus on the next connection, and by all means letting them know that nothing can divide us, that the relationship is bigger than the problem behavior. By matchmaking them to other adults who will take care to preserve their connection with us, they need to have a favorite aunt, a favorite uncle during those adolescent times where they can go to get a little bit of distance from us, but we know that they're but that we're, we're giving them into the hands of individuals who will preserve the connections with us, not take them away from us, and being the ones to introduce them to the other adults and children involved in their lives. And then the final slide. We need to hold on to children until they can hold on to us when apart from us. I guess asked over and over again, well, when is a child ready? And developmental psychology is all about readiness. When are they ready? It's different for a different child. But the issues of readiness are, is uh, when a child can hold on to us, when apart from us, that is, it does the emotional connection uh, there, do they still know they matter to us? Are they still using us as a compass point? Or they do, do they come home with their friends laugh? Or their friends taste in clothes? Or their friends values? Can they hold on to us, when apart from us? When they can, uh, and to the degree that they can, uh, then, uh, then the interaction with peers is not going to sabotage the context for raising them. Uh, can they hold on to themselves when with their peers? Or, or do they lose themselves? And again, bring home their peers' thoughts and ideas and laughs and values rather than hold on, in, on, on to themselves. And of course, hold on to our children until our work is done. We have the longest, longest span of childhood ever. It's now estimated that adolescence does not end until the early 20s. It used to end at age 15. That meant we had, we had 12 years of childhood, a very quick turnaround. The adolescence was not even a word 
until about 75 years ago. And so we had a very, very quick movement and a transition from childhood to adulthood. Now we have a very complex society. Adolescence goes into the early 20s. We have doubled the time of childhood. And so now we need to hold on to our children longer because as long as, as, as they need us, they need to be attached to us for us to be able to do our job. And so until our work is done or until maturity does not part. Well, I hope I've been able to make an invisible problem visible. I hope that once you see it, it becomes self-evident to you. Uh, that's often what I get. Oh, my goodness, I didn't see it, but now that you say it, I see it. And when you see it, you realize that, uh, that the answer is truly that children need to be attached to the adults responsible for them, and we can get on with looking at what that means of how to do this and with how to hold on to our children so that we can do our job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.